Today, our children have the ability and right to attend a neighborhood public school and to receive an education that will prepare them for the future. But history has shown that this hasn't always been the case for everyone. In Southwest Virginia, as in other parts of America, segregation was the law, and less than standard facilities and opportunities were the norm for African-American children. Yet through it all, there have been dedicated men and women who believe that all children needed an equal education and worked hard to provide it, with the hope that change would eventually take place. In the early years of our country's formation, there were no public schools. Children were educated by their parents at home. In 1701, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel was formed in England. Its purpose was to send priests and school teachers to the colonies to bring the church's ministry to the colonists and to take the message of the gospel to the slaves and native Indians. They built charity schools in most of the early colonies. And in addition to educating the colonists' children, two slaves in each area were allowed to be educated. They, in turn, were to educate other slaves. After the Civil War, the Freedmen's Bureau, along with the efforts of many churches from northern states, came to the South to intentionally educate the newly freed slaves. When the Freedmen's Bureau concluded their efforts in 1872, 21% of African-American children could read and write. In 1876, Richard Henry Scott, a 19-year-old African-American teacher from Chesterfield County, Virginia, came to Withville and is credited with paving the road to education for African-American children in Wythe County. In addition to teaching in Withville, Scott also taught at Ivanhoe, Max Meadows, and Cripple Creek. He began his teaching in an old weathered Freedmen's Bureau building, which was a combination church school building. They felt that this school was not large enough. So to, make, to solve that problem, what they did was to break the school off from the church. The Freedmen's School was raised or torn down, and on that same site, there was another school building, what we called then the graded A or the Whitfield Normal School. It was here, in what would come to be known as the Whitfield Training School, that African-American children from Whitfield and the surrounding area would be educated. They've always had devotion, devotional period in the morning. We'd enter into the big assembly room, everybody, open with a prayer and a scripture and a song. Then we were sent to our room. And during, after that, we had to put our hands on the desk, on the desk, and she came around to expect to see if your nails were clean. And then we would go into our reading, and we, and our writing, and then our math. That's what we had, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Constructed of wood with weatherboard siding, the Withville Training School had four rooms with oil-soaked floors to settle the dust. Each room had its own pot belly stove, and the students would take turns retrieving firewood and drinking water each day. From 1922 to 1931, the Julius Rosenwald Foundation was a significant driving force for the improvement of African-American education in Wythe County. Schools were built with matching funds provided by the foundation, which was created by the Chicago entrepreneur Julius Rosenwald, who directed the booming growth of Sears Roebuck and Company. To receive Rosenwald money, the local African-American community and the local white community both had to contribute a portion of the building funds. All were one-story frame structures incorporating the most advanced construction theories of the day and designed to accommodate one to four teachers. Lois Brown attended the Rosenwald Felt School in Ivanhoe. The inside, especially the first grade, it was four rows of seats. Then we had the big blackboard. And they had the big doors dividing the two rooms. And whenever we would have anything, especially our, our glee clubs and whatever on Friday, they would always open up the big doors and they would slide around and hide the blackboards and then everybody would be in one room. And we would always uh, have a program on Fridays. That was the end of the week. It was really nice. In the 1930s, the 10th grade was added to the Withville Training School, yet no diploma or certificate was given for successfully completing the coursework at Withville Training School. 
That changed, though, in 1941, when seven students who graduated from the Whitfield Training School passed the Virginia State Examination for High School Competition. With that, the Whitfield Training School and Wythe County issued its first diploma to African-American students after 65 years in existence. When I received my diploma from Whitfield Training School, that was to show that we had finished the 11th grades of the schoolwork. I'm thinking that when we graduated from Whitfield Training School that we had high hopes that the fact that we were getting a diploma and were the first to do so, that it was going to help us. The 1940s saw many changes at the Whitfield Training School. New principals were coming in with new ideas, and they felt that the Whitfield Training School before 1940 were really not up to par with some of the other schools, not only in this area as African-American schools, and certainly not up to par with Christiansburg Institute of Christiansburg, Virginia, that they needed more programs other than reading, writing, arithmetic, and perhaps some literature. In 1944, the Harmons were hired. Chauncey Harmon was hired to become the new principal and to teach geometry, government, and history. His wife, Lucy, was hired to teach eighth grade science, geography, English, history, and girls' health. The parents and the children in Whiffle Training School were just ideal. It was a, 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 a real joy just to walk the streets sometime. You, I, I could hear them way away hollering, hey, Miss Harmon, hey, Miss Harmon. It made you feel good. You, you know, they weren't shy running away from you. Having served previously in a similar position in Pulaski, Virginia, Mr. Harmon had a vision for education and a passion for carrying it out. Over the years, the school began publishing a newspaper, the Training School Oracle, held a junior-senior prom, and formed a football team. Mr. Harmon's influence with the football team was, he didn't know any football, <laughs> but he wanted us to play. So he went along with us. In 1943, we didn't have enough players to have a, a full-scale scrimmage, and our coach, uh, Coach Irvin, told us once uh, the Withful Training School is in the same shape we're in. They don't have enough players to scrimmage either, so we've come up with an idea that we think will help both teams. I've invited them to bring their team over here, and we'll, we'll have a, a full-scale scrimmage here on the field a couple of times, and we think it will help both teams. Uh, he did caution us. Now, uh, there's not a thing in the world wrong with that, but you might be a little bit careful about what you say at home. It's possible some of the parents might, might take exception to it. There wasn't any racial, as far as you could tell. We scrimmaged against each other, and we got along fine. The whole idea of the scrimmages was to help each team uh, become the best it could be, and I know it helped us, and I hope it helped them. I think it did. The existing Rosenwald schools were soon found to be insufficient to handle the growing population of African-American school-aged children who lived outside the city of Withville and surrounding Wythe County. High school-aged students began to bus, truck, carpool, and walk to Withville, coming from as far as Carroll, Grayson, Bland, and the Pulaski County line just to attend Withville Training School. The Rosenwald schools continued to operate, but were now used for primary school classes only. I would have to get up, I believe it was about 5.30 or 6 o'clock, because my mom would always cook breakfast, and I would always have to wash the dishes before I'd leave going to school. And I would say I'd leave home about 7 o'clock in the mornings, and then walk from there down to Ivanhoe. I walked that path, rain, snow, or whatever, Every day that we had school, I would walk. The bus was hardly ever late, but we would have to wait until he came. And a lot of times, if he was late, we would build a safari out of old, old uh, pine tree limbs or whatever we could get to keep warm by until he came. In 1944, to help ease the overcrowding at the Whitfield Training School, a small Rockdale school was purchased and moved adjacent to the Whitfield Training School to house the fourth and fifth grades. Craig Felty attended the Rockdale School before it was moved to Whitfield. Rockdale School was a one-room school building. It only had one door, 
On each side of the door there were coat rooms. At that time we called them cloak rooms where we kept our coats and our lunch. It, on the north side of the building, it was almost entirely a blackboard where we could work simultaneously. It was double desk. You always had a desk mate. There was a pot-bellied coal stove, a coal scuttle the students kept filled, and it had a front porch, and on each side it had toilets, which back then we called privies, and they were complete with Sears and Roebuck catalogs. Another classroom was located a few blocks away from the Whitfield Training School to house home economic classes and a lunchroom. The teachers at Whitfield Training School, like most schools, took a sincere interest in their students and went beyond the regular coursework to see that the children were loved and well-rounded in their development and character. Lisa Harmon was my favorite teacher because she took a lot of interest in everyone. She was a mother to you when you were away from home. I had children from Rural Retreat, little Betty Jo Hanley, Ann Hanley, Owen Ivanhoe was Eunice Absher, Helen Crockett, Ruth Crockett, and many, many children from all over the area. And many of these children who had good ability could not stay for afternoon uh, things and things that we had to have at night, like plays and so forth. And we would house them. Sometimes I'd have seven and eight children staying in my house there on Franklin Street in Whitfield to stay so that they could be in a play or something of that sort. We were taught respect, decency. We were taught that in school then. And we were taught right from wrong. And we knew right from wrong. And if we went, did wrong, it wasn't because we didn't know any better. And the teachers and our parents were great examples. And they worked together along with the churches to see that the, we made the best of our lives. By the early 1950s, with so many children needing education, talk of integration was common. So to get by what might become an unavoidable situation, the school board purchased land and plans were drawn up to construct a new building, which was to be called the New Withville Training School. Because of objections to the proposed name of the new school, the school board reconsidered the name. They approved the name that was selected by the PTA of the Withville Training School, which was Scott Memorial High School, in honor of the late Richard Henry Scott for his efforts to bring quality education to the African-American children of Wythe County. With the opening of Scott Memorial High School, the Withville Training School was no longer needed, and its doors were closed in the fall of 1951. After its closing as a school, the building had many tenants and slid into a state of disrepair. In 1999, the building was purchased by the Withe County Historical Society to be held in trust for the Withville Training School Cultural Center. The goal of the Cultural Center is to have the former Withville Training School building become a technology center and cultural site. The center continues to raise funds to repay the historical society for the building and to support its ongoing efforts to provide educational training experiences, enabling it to continue to be a place of education. Yet today, when you stand on the front porch or walk through the classrooms, if you listen carefully, you can still hear the sounds of children at play or hear the lessons from the dedicated teachers who committed their lives to bring equal quality education to the African-American children of Wythe County. And as I pass the school now, I look, I can just see everything as it was then. I can just see us going up those steps. <laughs> I have precious memories, precious memories. This video is an introduction to the many interesting African-American heritage sites that can be found by taking the Wythe County African-American Driving Tour of Withville and Wythe County.
For more information, contact the Whitfield Convention and Visitors Bureau at 1-877-347-8307 or on the web at www.visitwithville.com.